Hey there, entrepreneurs. My name is Sushant and welcome to Trip Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives, and thought leaders, and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their business. And today I'm really excited to welcome Sean Geng to the show. Sean is the chairman and chief operating officer of Smoke Cartel. Smoke Cartel is a leading online retailer and wholesaler of glass water pipes, vaporizers, and other related accessories of the cannabis industry. The company has differentiated itself by providing a wide variety of high quality products, 24 seven customer service, and fast shipping. Smoke Cartel went public in 2017 and is now a multi-million dollar business. And today I want to ask Sean a few questions about his startup story, starting Smoke Cartel and some of the strategies and tactics he has used to grow his e-commerce business. So thank you so much for joining us today, Sean. At yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's, let's get right into it. I'm really excited. Your company uh, is uh, really interesting. So I want to know, how did you get started? How did you get the idea? And yeah, what, what, what is your startup story? Sure. Um, my background is in the tech industry. So, you know, I worked primarily as a freelance and, and full stack developer for a number of companies, including at a start, uh, startup incubator. Um, and so I had a lot of experience in tech. Um, I started Smoke Cartel when we were seeing a lot of the legalization efforts happening on a state level in several states here in the U.S., um, primarily, you know, beginning with Colorado going medical and recreational uh, with cannabis. And, you know, I was a cannabis user. I started shopping online for some accessories and realized that there was um, a good opportunity in this space to provide a lot more of the innovative products and especially some of the newer designs and uh, some of the newer technologies that were emerging in an industry where a lot of people were pushing for innovation and getting started and there was a lot of uh, interest in. And so um, I built the e-commerce store and, you know, we kind of focused on some of the basics at first, which was like, hey, let's just educate customers, right? Because there's a lot of people coming into the space who have never uh, tried smoking accessories before or never tried cannabis before, and, and they needed a lot of guidance. And there was a lot of stuff out there. Um, not all the products were good. And so we wanted to curate and deliver high quality products and, and more importantly, product education to uh, a, a growing segment of users. Um, and I think it uh, worked out well because we built a pretty large audience um, and a, a great deal of trust and respect uh, in the industry um, as a brand. And we're continuing to stay true to those missions and values as we uh, look into the future and as we continue to scale. And so you, you started your company in 2013. Yeah, 2013, 2014, something like that. So I'm very interested to know, as uh, you know, cannab cannabis industry is still relatively, I would say, new in terms of you know, legalization, things like that. Um, anyone who does not know much about this industry itself as a, as a business, can you share a little bit about, you know, what does the cannabis industry look like in 2020? Who are the major players? Where does your business fit into this, the whole ecosystem? And yeah, where, where, where do you think the industry is going? Yeah, uh, the, the cannabis industry has changed quite a lot in the last decade. Um, we, you know, at first, when, when the industry was in its infancy, there was a lot of entrepreneurs and, and startups who were entering the space. You know, there was a huge amount of demand and interest uh, in entrepreneurs trying their hand in the space. And... Um, it was a great time for innovation and, and a lot of explosion. And uh, I think we saw a lot of different states and governments trying different types of regulation. Um, and now, you know, I think that a lot of people are looking at it and trying to evaluate what, what worked, what didn't, 
Um, and among the business landscape, the, the result was, you know, there were a different, a constantly changing set of rules. And so companies had to be very adaptive and they had to be very lean um, and have really strong business models to, to be able to survive. You know, the, the current landscape is very competitive. Uh, there's obviously still a lot of interest. There's um, a lot of larger corporations and a lot of capital being used strategically uh, in the industry, um, whether that's through acquisitions or through strategic investments or partnerships. Um, I think we saw a lot of the f people who kind of came in in the industry in the first wave either make it or break it. And now we have kind of a second wave of people who are trying to problem solve for you know unique cases in our industry. And, and we're seeing um, some players try to establish themselves, but I, I don't think there's a clear winner of any kind. And I don't think, you know, even if you look at from like a public markets perspective, uh, from the investment community, I, I, I don't think anyone's kind of like flagged, oh, this is like a clear front runner, right? The, the, the feedback is very much, you know, a lot of capital was invested. Let's wait and see how those investments turned out. You know, did they meet the ROIs that some investors were expecting? Um, did they not? Did they meet? Did we discover something else along the way? And so uh, I think there's a lot of capital um, either waiting on the sidelines uh, or, you know, people who have diversified portfolios into a bunch of different segments. They really want to be uh, invested in the cannabis industry throughout the growth cycles. Um, and, and a lot of uh, businesses who are um, adapting right now or, or failing to adapt. And so uh, it's really exciting is what I'll say. It's it's uh, constantly changing, one in the regulation landscape, but but also two in the competitive landscape. So as, as, as your business, Smoke Cartel, you describe it more as a retailer and distributor. Um, I would assume there's like some brands that actually produce different strains of cannabis there's like other brands that produce like the accessories and things like that mm -hmm. um are there uh, are there other players in this also like what yeah. where does the innovation come in like is it that you innovate in terms of producing new strains new products new ways of consuming cannabis or um... yeah. so there's there's innovation happening on, on a lot of sides you know from the the people who produce the consumable goods um, that's like cannabis and cannabis derivatives. Uh, the innovation is primarily happening in the derivative side, which is, you know, the grow aspect of it has more or less been mastered in a sense. Like it's, you know, you're growing a crop, right? And so it becomes just a lot of yield science um, and people with agricultural. And, and you're not interested in that. You're not as a business. No. Owner. So with Smoke Cartel, we don't do anything that touches the cannabis plant itself. Uh, we're in a state where we don't have a recreational program. And we do business uh, throughout the United States as well as internationally. Primarily, our audience base is here in the United States. But because we're you know shipping products to every state, we don't do anything that actually touches the plant. We do accessories, we do CBD products, and we'll do you know counterculture and things like that that fit within the scope of uh, the consumer base. But we're not able to actually sell cannabis itself uh, online, and so it's it's not something that we're federally able to do until uh, either the, the laws change or. Um, you know, something else happens. And so, uh, you know, I always like to look at it as I think with every, um, you know, a lot of people refer to the cannabis industry growth as like the, the green rush as compared to like the gold rush, for example. Well, um, a, a pretty conservative bet as to who wins, you know, who strikes it rich uh, in the gold rush, just comparatively to the green rush is the same answer. You know, the guy who sells you the shovels. So at the end of the day, um, I don't think that selling accessories and things like that is, is ever going to delineate too far away from the growth of the industry itself. You know, as we see more 
demand from users and more customers introduced to the cannabis industry, so will the demand for uh, auxiliary products um, and CBD products continue to grow. And uh, we've positioned ourselves to be able to capture that growing segment very well and, and to continue to, to scale with the industry without incurring any of the traditional liability that uh, a cannabis company who, who has to go through all these regulations has to deal with because they're plant touching. But isn't that also a bit of a challenge where um, any company who wants to get into this accessory business uh, can, can act like there's not a, a huge barrier to entry. Like anyone can, you know, any manufacturer that is creating these products can go to them and, you know, start uh, yeah. buying these products. Start yeah, absolutely. Them, right? You know, and that's, you know, you, you're, you're right. Like there is not a huge, uh, you might not think there's a large uh, economic moat, let's say, uh, barrier entry, but there, there actually is in a number of other ways. Um, yes, you know, if you have some capital, you can absolutely go out and, let's say, try to manufacture a product. If you have an idea, you know, by all means, I think plenty of entrepreneurs do, and they, and they bring new products to market uh, in the industry constantly. So we see an explosion of innovation that's still continuing to happen in terms of new and innovative products, whether that's for consumption or for lifestyle or whatever. Um, but to actually capture uh, a segment of users is tricky because you can't really advertise the way that you traditionally can, right? So your, your growth strategy is primarily limited to um, the success of your product. And, and what I think has continued to happen in the industry is that there's a lot of good products, but almost all of those products are one-off products. So you can, it's, it's really hard for somebody to build a brand off of just one product. Um, whereas we, you know, play the role of the retailer and we've consistently built customers over time and are able to leverage new products by, you know, partnerships or, or just letting them sell on our sites or uh, purchasing the products directly and, and being able to offer that to our existing customer base where we've already developed quite a bit of trust with uh, just throughout time um, and through our reputation in the industry. So I want to take you to the first year of your startup uh, because it's always very in, uh, interesting to to know this, you know, how does someone start? I, I believe you guys started with $600, in, which I read. Um, can you take me to the first, you know, one or two years of how do you go from an idea and that six hundred dollars, and and start building that? You know, what were your first products? How did you uh, get your first customers? You know, what was your revenue and at the end of the first year and the second year? Um, because a lot of other people, other entrepreneurs, were starting out. They would be very interested. Yeah, absolutely. Um... We had the fortune where, you know, I had a tech background and so we were able to mitigate a lot of the startup costs that came with, say, development, right? If somebody says, I want to get into e-commerce, well, unless you're a developer or you have some experience in it already, it's going to be a little trickier um, to offer kind of like a custom experience outside of just, say, like a templated store um, out the gate. And so, you know, we were able to do that because I put in sweat equity. Um, the capital was used strictly to purchase some inventory. Uh, and we selected some some products that um, you know I spent. So in the beginning, it was you and I believe you had a co-founder also. Was, was it yeah. two people? What's that? Yeah, um, it was myself and uh, my co-founder Darby. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, we sourced uh, products and, um, you know, there's a good margin uh, within like glass products is where we started. So that was identified as a good segment to be in. Um, I think a lot of people like when they start e-commerce specifically, the, the idea of product curation is a little bit tricky. And I think some people tend to go like super broad, right? Like, they're like I want to carry a little bit of everything, you know, all the, the top sellers. I'm like, well, um, I, I think it's better to, to try a few things that you feel really good about, you know, wait for 
you to establish a good return on investment on it. You know, look at what your final margin is going to be and then look into expanding based on where the demand goes from the customer side rather than trying to put products out there and hope you hit the right customers. Right. It's it's um, I, I think it's better to specialize, especially in the e-commerce space. You know, because there are giants like Amazon out there who are like, you're not going to really compete with them on selection. Um, but of course, you can always compete on um, having specialty products and having uh, a good customer experience. And and in terms of uh, sourcing the products and, and creating that curated experience, like, are, were these products all from the US or did you go overseas to... Uh, to get more like less expensive or, or you know, better value for money? We looked at both. Um, there's a lot of demand in our industry, at least from the you know social and, and community side that's vocal about uh, you know some American made products. We do carry both and we did carry both you know ever since the start. Um, for me, you know everything is is about testing and in what does the data back? Um, we're moving, you know, there's a segment of audience who's willing to pay a premium for uh, an American made glass, you know, pipe. And there's a segment of people who, who just want something standardized and affordable. Um, and we'll often source that uh, abroad, right, from China or India or Nepal or any of these places that uh, we can remain competitive on the labor rates. And we let the, you know, it's it's an open market. And so we let the supplier dictate the, the price level and, and we um, choose a competitive and, and quality option uh, from the marketplace. Now, one thing that you mentioned was, you know, the the your development experience and the ability to create that custom e-commerce platform. And so my, my question would be, why why go that path? Because I would assume in 2013, I think you still had like these e-commerce platforms like Shopify or Bitcoin. So I'm like, I'm, I'm in product management. So you know, from my perspective, it's like, why not, instead of spending all the time doing the development for like, you know, creating a new e-commerce platform, why not just choose choose like a pre-built solution? It may not be the most customi- customizable thing, yeah. but uh, at least it gets you started like quickly. And Yeah. Well, and, uh, and so then, what was the decision behind doing that? Yeah, we, we do use Shopify uh, in terms of custom development work. There's a lot that happens on the back end um, that we do for analytics work. There's a lot that happens in terms of the customizations that we've made to the platform. Um, what I'm simply speaking is, you know, a lot of people, you can start uh, a Shopify store, you know, straight away and, and just use like a boilerplate template. Um, but you're really limited in what you can offer in terms of a user experience. If you want to get into uh, a really consistent brand experience and a really consistent uh, product experience from any number of like customizations you want to make, you're going to have to know a bit of development work. Um, and even more, if you want to do like, you know, what we do, which is like sometimes like custom apps, you know, different kinds of like, you know, front end proxies and things like that so that we can achieve, uh, the functionality that we're looking for. And, and, and do you consider these apps? Like, do you, do you, do you make them a product? Like, can other people also use it or is it? Most. Yeah, most of the applications that we've done in terms of the custom um, builds are entirely used by us. You know, we've got one app that we've made publicly available on the, the App Store um, that's us kind of testing out a, a different arm for revenue in the business, which is SaaS. You know, we've got a lot of applications that we've built um, that have practical applications for other merchants, you know, we will have to evaluate whether or not it's worth the expenditure to go and pursue that. But, you know, we're, we're certainly testing um, our experience in that uh, revenue stream. Um, 
and we're, we're open to it. But at the end of the day, you know, the even continuing to utilize the degree of customizations and proprietary technology that we do have continues to deliver a competitive advantage for us as a business. So um, it's been, of course, worth the investment. Um, can you share a little bit about, you know, I know you said you, you know, some of the products you get from within US, some of the products you source it. Uh, so, so mostly what you're doing is you're buying, you're creating the products and, and warehousing. Is that, uh, or, or do you also manufacture? We have done uh, all of the above at one point uh, and another. You know, when we first started the business, it was we were purchasing products from a, a brand or supplier, and uh, you know we buy them at wholesale and we sell them on retail. Um, it's obviously a very simple uh, supply chain. Um, we've diversified a lot since then. You know, we've done acquisitions where we've acquired um, somebody who was in the wholesale side of it to get more vertically integrated and to have access to the um, better margins in the supply chain to do manufacturing. Um, we've done that. Um, we have tried a lot of different things to evaluate whether or not this will work in the cannabis industry. Uh, at the end of the day, where we've essentially uh, are now and where we've kind of honed the business model to be at this point is to be very operationally efficient while producing the maximum uh, profits that we can. And so that often means we are working with a lot of suppliers uh, to build a bit of a marketplace model where we recognize that there is a lot of innovation happening in the industry and we want everyone to participate in this free market system and to be able to leverage our customer base. And so we'll, we have very symbiotic relationships with a lot of brands, new and old and established, uh, where we allow them to sell on our store and fulfill the orders directly to our customers while we retain um, you know, our, our margin on it. And so this effectively reduces our cost carrying burden significantly you know, from us having to manage manufacturers, which we still do, and we still produce and, and fulfill our own in-house brands. Um, but it's allowed us to be a lot more lean rather than trying to supply and demand plan for, you know, two to 400 plus different vendors and brands to focusing on the ones we do best and then letting uh, those individual brands and suppliers dictate their own uh, supply chain making it a lot more efficient from a business perspective. Yeah. So basically it is that now you have built this brand, you have a certain traffic to your website, and now you've, you've created this marketplace where uh, these brands can come and put their products on your site. You already have the people coming and shopping, and you basically charge a commission to purchase. How, how your business Yeah, works. yeah. It's, you know, we've adopted a very similar marketplace model that I think, you know, places like Etsy or Amazon are utilizing that we've seen continue to win out over time. At the end of the day, the focus is about how can we deliver the most value to our customer base and how do we grow that customer base? And the answers often align in a way that's very symbiotic to uh, the manufacturers and suppliers that we work with, which is, hey, if we can optimize this um, supply chain, and these fulfillment agreements, then we can not only provide very consistent, very uh, high stock levels on our inventory and have an extremely expanded product catalog uh, and be able to deliver a great experience to the customers by handling all of that um, logistics work internally. And a lot of it's yeah, all I mean, that, by that, technology. So. That's, that sounds very interesting, and uh, the interesting part also is that you know, you're know you leveraging Shopify, which I assume then if you're doing all this development, that would be on Shopify Plus probably, uh, where you're able to make changes to market. Our, our, the Shopify hosts our store, so it's like the front end, right? When people actually go and check out through the, the site, they're using, you know, they're, they're seeing um, a Shopify hosted store, you know, our site specifically is modified and customized like 
years and years and years. And so it's, it's extremely um, customized in terms of like just every facet of it. But um, we still rely on Shopify for the hosting and, you know, the PCI compliance certifications and all of that. Um, when an order is placed a lot, then our technology kicks in and handles a lot of that routing technology so that we can make sure that, that um, the products that are being ordered are delivered and the appropriate information is being relayed back to the customers uh, in the most seamless way that we can offer. Um, so, so I was thinking because Shopify, because it's a closed system, and please correct me if I'm wrong. So basically your, your code is interacting with Shopify using APIs or because I thought that they don't allow a lot of customization, but I may be. We do, I mean, we've been developing on Shopify for like five, six years at this point. So we're, we're you know, uh, a Shopify Plus certified partner. Um, we have um, a good communication with Shopify and we have a lot of things that we figured out how to do through either the APIs or through some other methodology. But I mean, when there's a will, there's a way. And, um, you know, okay. I think we have smart people. And so we, we tend to figure out how to do what we want to do. Okay. Um, I want to know a little bit about your team. So um, can you show, share, um, you know, what your team looks like right now? Of course, right now, I think probably. I'm very interested in knowing, like, you, know, you mentioned you have developers. You know, what does your marketing team look like? Yeah. So uh, right now our team's probably about a dozen people. Um, we at one point, you know, when we were doing all of our own warehousing and things like that, we probably had close to like fifty uh, people um, doing all kinds of things from you know receiving to picking to packing and and, and all that. Um, that's great and all, but at the end of the day, you know, we realize like, hey, we don't want to run a warehousing business. That's separate. Um, the cost benefit of doing so was really marginal um, in terms of us simply just like outsourcing our fulfillment or um, moving to like a marketplace model like we did now. Um, and so we are able to save a considerable amount of expenses and really lean down our operating structure to a core team of about a dozen people, um, you know, that are remote, the uh, customer service, um, marketing, you know, photography, administrative, and, and of course, uh, the C-suite uh, level executives. And so um, it's people that we've had for a while. Of course, building a good team takes a lot of time. Um, you know, we've, we've hired and, and fired a lot of folks uh, over the years um, to get to the team that we are today and it's it's a well-oiled machine yeah I mean it makes sense like you basically have pivoted from you know that sourcing products to, to fulfilling to now a market uh, the team has to um, as an entrepreneur and as a chief operating officer what what does your day usually look like? What like what are your biggest priorities in the day? Uh, where do you focus? Um, so my my role with the company right now is I'm the chief technology officer. We have uh, an interim CEO named Steve, um, and so primarily he deals with a lot of our uh, executive strategy and um, a lot of the public market stuff primarily. Um, I like to focus on the operations and so you know I work very closely with our team here locally uh, where I am in Savannah. We've got some folks in a small office here uh, for marketing and um, some warehousing and whatnot and so you know my typical day it looks like problem solving, right? With any entrepreneur, there's, there's always something and we're always pushing to innovate uh, quickly. And so um, it's a tight knit group and everyone has known each other for a while now and, and gets along great. And, um, you know, we work on uh, projects to push the business forward. 
um, as well as, you know, problem solve. You know, how can we make the problems that we continue to experience uh, lesser or, you know, how can we solve them so that they don't happen again? Um, I want to talk a little bit about your marketing because you're in, in an interesting space. Um, and I know that uh, some of the traditional marketing, as you said before, uh, does not, you're not able to do like, uh, I believe, advertising, online Google ads and Facebook ads and those kinds of things. Um, I'm very interested in knowing, like from the beginning, what kind of, uh, and I know you, you mentioned before that it was more of education and things like that. Um, what, how has your marketing evolved from the beginning and what is working really great right now? I know that your social media channels have a huge problem. I'm sure that helps. Yeah. Uh, in our industry, you can't advertise on your traditional like ad networks, you know, Google, um, Facebook, Instagram, you know, et cetera, uh, which is really challenging in e-commerce because a lot of entrepreneurs basically either heavily rely on it or, or it makes up almost all of their income. Um, where they're basically spending money on ad spend and, and getting an ROI for it. And, and that's, um, you know, their profit margin right there. So without the ability to do that, you know, we rely heavily on um, social word of mouth as well as search engine optimization. So, you know, organic traffic, direct traffic, um, and good customer retention once they land on site. Um, a lot of the effort done over the years was in conversion rate optimization where we're looking to maximize the value that we can get out of the visitors who land on our site um, to really leave an impression with them. Uh, and we've done things like retarget advertising and, and um, kind of retarget style display ads and things like that on networks that we can do uh, to be able to recapture as much of the segment as we can. Um, but it is very challenging. Uh, I think advertising is one of the big reasons why like people come into cannabis and, and fail because they, they realize that, oh, all of the things that they thought they knew how to do in e-commerce don't really apply here. So it's, it's like trying to operate in e-commerce with like two hands tied behind your back. Uh, and so you, you're forced to be creative uh, and you're forced to do it in a sustainable way because even if you get, you know, let's say like one viral post or, you know, you do things like that, it's, that's not enough, right? You, you can have one hit wonders uh, and plenty of people do quite often, but uh, a business that lasts many, many years uh, is built on a consistent returning customer base uh, and steady uh, revenue growth. And um, in terms of customer retention, um what uh, so do you see that a lot of people come like there are, there's a high percentage of returning customers and like do you do you engage them using email marketing what what methods to engage customers so that they keep on interacting yeah uh, we we boast a pretty good return customer rate um, in my experience, uh, it's, it's typically been a bit higher than our competitors. Um, I think that has a lot to do with our experience that we try to deliver to our customers, our, our brand, uh, and our marketing efforts. Um, we use a lot of different tools for recapture and reacquisition, um, and some of them include email. You know, we'll do push notifications, um, SMS marketing. Um, you know, Facebook Messenger retargeting, um, you know, retargeting display ads, uh, whatever is available to us. Uh, if if we look at it and we evaluate it and it has a good uh, ROI, then we'll likely to continue to, to use it. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in knowing is, um, you know, you did go public uh, in 2017. Um, I believe. Um, what was the, the 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 thought process behind that, and ha how has it helped? Uh, we went public because we wanted to have access to the capital markets that were available. You know, this there's a lot of interest from uh, investors 
uh, to participate in the cannabis industry and not a lot of great uh, brands or businesses um, that have been established to, to allow them to do so. And so we wanted the access to the capital markets. We, we did raise some capital, which helped fuel uh, a degree of growth to where we are today and helped us get through um, some ups and downs in the industry altogether that impacted just about everybody. Um, and so it was a strategic decision. Um, we still remain public, of course, and we are continuing to hone on the fundamentals of the business to demonstrate consistent growth and to demonstrate uh, improving um, profitability across the board um, to attract uh, more interest uh, over time. You know, I'm not a get rich quick kind of guy. I, I prefer to do it the right way uh, and to go slow and steady and, and actually win the race. And uh, we're looking to attract people who want to come along for that kind of a ride. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to our rapid fire round. And the idea here is that I'll ask you a few questions and you just have okay. a couple of words or sentences. Okay. Um, any book recommendations for entrepreneurs or business executives in 2020? Um, I don't know, Are you a book reader? Recently, uh, it was like how to win people, uh, how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie, um, which is a terrific read. It's it's an old book, but um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in this day and age where it's a very polarizing time, like people get into arguments and and there's kind of a lot of maybe like a lack of like networking ability for for some folks. But I think that getting along with people in business and having a synergy and cooperative spirit really goes a long way um and so i think people should especially in 2020 remember that uh if they want to continue to succeed perfect uh, an innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce retail or tech landscape that uh... um we're starting to see a lot more like augmented reality and vr stuff happening in the e-commerce um you know, we're very happy with Shopify. We've been with them for since our inception. Uh, and so they've continued to push out updates um, to their technology, which has been great. Uh, we see plenty of stores, including Shopify, uh, experimenting with augmented reality uh, and VR options. And I think that that uh, is going to be really interesting uh, in the future. Uh, a productivity tool or software that you or you? Uh, we use Slack. Slack is good. A uh, startup or business in e-commerce, retail or tech that you think is? Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a, a, a company called Dirty Lemon. They 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 sell like a beverage of some kind. Uh, and uh, I saw for a while they were, you could only order from this company via text message, um, which I thought was kind of, prohibitive at first, but I think is actually genius in a way. Um, so I'm, I'm always interested when I see businesses kind of go a different path, especially in a well-established uh, industry like e-commerce and where there's kind of like a rule book on, on what you should do. Uh, and so I think it's, it's always important that people like just ignore the rules and, and try to do something different because, you know, it could work. That sounds good. Um, a peer entrepreneur or business person who has inspired you? Or who? Yeah, I've had a lot of like really good mentors over the years, especially in the tech industry. Um, uh, I think uh, I, I work closely with uh, a company called Namaste Technologies, um, and I really respect the the CEO Manny, uh, who who's also you know they're a public company and uh, he's from the tech space. So I think we, we kind of relate on a lot of different things. And finally, um, the best business advice that you have ever received or you would? Uh, just don't be afraid to fail. You know, it's failure is good and as long as you're learning from it. So, yeah, those were all the questions I, I had today. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us today, Sean. And now is your time if you want to share your website or any other product.
the services. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on your podcast and uh, I'm glad you're doing this in, in a time when, you know, I think it's difficult for a lot of people and, and uh, it's good to see people make the most out of it. And it's been really enlightening to see people pursue, you know, creative and entrepreneurial endeavors. And I, of course, encourage everyone to because you make the best out of your situation, right? It's 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 a difficult time for sure. And, and uh, we're 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 going to get through this together. Um, if anyone ever wants to uh, check out our site, we're at smokecartel.com. Um, if you're a cannabis user specifically, I'm, I'm sure we'll have something for you. And uh, please check it out. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Sean, for joining and for sharing your time and your story and the strategy. Yeah, absolutely. It's good talking to you.